Thank you. So my name is uh, Robin Raymond, and I'm the chief architect for HookFlash, and who's sponsoring a project called OpenPeer, which is an open, secure, uh, real-time communication signaling protocol. Try to say that quickly. Okay. So I'm going to go over. I mean, the agenda's up there, but uh, basically, I'm going to go over the um, makeup of a video. Uh, chat application, some of the key concepts involved in building one. I've got three sample demos which uh, have been put together so that um, you can see what actually happens behind the scenes. And then uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the issues that you're going to run into in the future. So traditionally, a video chat application consists of, well, recording and rendering audio and video. Um, you also have, obviously, you're going to have texting involved, so um, you need a media engine so that you can actually process all this audio data, and you need a real-time communication stack so that you can send the media from one location to the other in real time, and obviously, you need a mechanism to find your contacts and to signal your intention to communicate to, to a peer or a contact, I should say. Um, now, traditionally, browsers, they take information from the web, they render it, you get minimum input from your keyboard, your mouse, you can upload a file, but they've never really been able to do anything with your microphone or camera. Well, mostly because you wouldn't want to be browsing the web and suddenly your camera comes on and you know, you're being filmed or spied upon. But someone had the clever idea of, um, uh, why can't we do this within the browser without having to install some crazy software or plugin or whatever you have to do. And thus, the idea of WebRTC was born. And uh, for those who don't know what it is, it's basically the marriage of web and real-time communications, which is obvious. Um, but the basic principle is, is that you take a um, media engine that's, and a real-time communication stack you shove them into the browsers, and that allows you access to your camera and microphone and allows you to send the media somewhere else. And then you just ask the user, do you want to turn on your camera? Do you want to allow this website to, uh, to, to record you? And voila, you've got, um, well, video chat. Except there's still something missing out of this picture, and it's really, really important. Who are you communicating with? What type of media are you communicating uh, over? Is it video, audio, text, or other screen share, whatever have you? Um, users going to want to signal when they want to communicate, because obviously they're not going to be communicating necessarily 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, where are the devices that uh, you're going to be communicating between? And how exactly are you going to signal from one user to the other that they want to communicate? And all of that is left out for you guys to figure out. So I'm going to go over some of the uh, concepts involved in building a video chat application on the web. And you need to understand these. Otherwise, it won't really make sense when you see any kind of API. The principle starts with a peer connection, which is literally a connection between one browser to the other. But more importantly, it describes all of your media types involved, um, your audio, video, your codecs to compress the data into a reasonable size, because you wouldn't want to send raw bi you know, binary um, video and audio streams over the wire without compressing it. Um, you've got the state of your media. For example, if you're on or off hold, um, and then you've got all your networking information because you need to know where you're going to be transmitting the, the media from and to. And finally, there's an optional data channel that you may want to use to actually um, send arbitrary data between. So in WebRTC, each peer is required to describe all of their capabilities. And Everything I just told you before, it's each peer does it, and they have to, well, I'll get to that, but they'll have to send it to the other. And they package it all up into something called STP. And it's a really 
ugly, horrifically bad thing, but for you guys, you probably can just treat it as a blob data type and kind of forget what it is. It comes from the legacy days of telephony, and hopefully that'll go away eventually, but it is there for now. And what you have to do is browser A needs to send what they want to browser B, and, and that's called the offer, and then browser B has to send what they want to browser A, and that's called the answer. And this is the offer answer SDP exchange. And uh, you're going to end up with, uh, this is a very typical situation on the internet. You've got two browsers, and they're going to want to communicate, but they're behind two independent firewalls. So if you actually tried to send data directly from browser A to browser B, you couldn't unless you're on the same LAN. So what you actually have to do in this kind of scenario is you have to send not to the other browser's IP address, but you actually got to send your data to the browser's firewall. And uh, each of these uh, devices on the internet has their own IP address. And you have to, as a browser does this for you, but you gather what's called ICE candidates. So if you see that in the, uh, in the WebRTC framework, that's what it is. It's literally a gathering of I uh, possible communication points between uh, two locations. And, and what it does internally is use something called uh, stun, ice, and turn to gather that information so that it can be transmitted to the other side. And because in some scenarios, you will actually need to relay the data. Act you won't be able to send the data directly between uh, you and the other firewall. You'll actually have to relay the data through a, an intermediate server on the internet. And then finally, um, you have the, once you've got the established media connection, you can send arbitrary data directly between one peer to the other. Now, I'm going to show you an example of what I mean by this offer answer and this SDP exchange. So hopefully this will work. Uh-oh. It's not loading. Oh, there it is. It's just the size issue. OK. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an offer. And so browser A creates an offer, and that's that awful SDP. And it gathered all the ICE candidates. And what you need to do is you need to send it up to the internet somehow. It's not defined. So Alice would send her SDP up to, the, up to the internet. Bob would then fetch that SDP over the internet. He would then create his answer. He would post his answer back up to the internet, which would then have to be fetched by Alice. And then once this happened, you connect the two browsers together. Oh, it didn't actually connect. Now, I'll show you why. But had it connected, you would have seen that. OK, and now I'm going to actually show you the source code involved in doing that particular scenario. So it's basically a simple form. And we're not actually sending it up to and from the internet, because we weren't sure if it was actually going to be available or not. But they're just buttons. And he, this is the offer button. And this is the most important one here. What you have to do is you first have to create your peer connection. And we're using a WebRTC shim because the browsers are still in flux at this point. So it's easier to write against one API than two or three or however many they are for the different browsers. And here, you'll see that RTB data channels, oh, no, not there. I'll show you a little bit later here, reliable, this is where you actually create a data channel and you add it to the peer connection, and reliable is equal to false. So it doesn't over always work right now because unfortunately, reliable uh, is not implemented in the browsers quite yet. So once you've created your, your data channel, you have to initiate 
the connection. And what you do is you create an offer, which then you have to remember the session description. And you have a callback routine here, which we set earlier, which is basically every time an ICE candidate is discovered, because it takes time to discover those ICE candidates, you get an event back, which you gather all those ICE candidates. And once you've received them all, you can post them over to the web, or you can optionally, what they call trickle, you can trickle that information from one peer to the other uh, live, and that will allow you to actually uh, hopefully have a faster connection time between the two browsers. But it's not required that you do that. So that's how you create the offer. And once you do that, it creates that ugly STP blob that you can send to the other party. So at the end here, what I do is once the final, once the final candidate has come in and you don't receive any candidates anymore, you create the final offer. And instead of us posting it up to the internet, I just remember it in a, a local variable on the page. And a similar thing happens on the answer. So when we click the answer, we create a peer connection for Bob. Although it's on the same browser, obviously, when you're implementing this uh, across the different uh, browsers, you wouldn't have them on the same page. And it's the same process where we, we have our, our event handler for receiving ICE candidates. Uh, we have our on data channel event, which will receive the data channel. We set our remote description, which we will receive. We create our answer, because we don't create an offer again, because you have, you're in the answer mode at this time. And then you have to basically post the answer back over the internet, which we store locally instead of sending it up to the internet. You fetch the answer, and then you basically go. You just start sending data once you're connected with this on open on your data channel. And that's it for the offer answer exchange. Doesn't seem too interesting right now, but we're going to get to more details here in a moment. OK. Let's go back to the thing here. Now, when it comes to um, user interaction, a user isn't going to want to see you know, that you're creating an offer and you're getting an answer, you're giving an answer and all this kind of stuff. They want to see more of a, a signaling scenario where Alice is going to signal to Bob that he's calling. Bob's either going to accept or decline the call. And once you accept, you have to allow the media. And give it a minute. We've got uh, myself twice up on the screen. And that's intentional, actually, because one of the advantages of using Chrome is it allows you to actually open up the same data source twice where we can actually simulate a call between two parties within the same browser. But I will do a remote call in a minute. OK, let me show you the code involved in doing this scenario. I'm just going to hang up here. Oops, sorry. Just a minute. There we go. Media. So there were, this is a very simple table view where you have uh, you know, uh, basically different video sources. There's four of them, One, uh, two for Alice, which is local and remote, and two for Bob, local and remote. And all of this is doing, when we hit the call button, it's just for, for the sake of simulation only. But when we accept, we're actually going to initiate the peer connection here. So here's where we're, we would normally do this each on individual browser, but we're doing it within the same browser. So um, in this case, Alice opens up a peer connection. Bob opens up a peer connection. They get user media, which is the, 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 what you have to do in order to obtain that SDP. And here's where it's interesting that all you have to do is set that uh, table view element to have a video source, 
which contains Alice's and Bob's local video stream URL. And that's all you have to do to display yourself, your own camera. But here's where we have, we'll have a couple events I'll get to in a minute. And so what's gonna happen here is that Alice adds her local stream to the peer connection. Bob adds his local stream to the peer connection, which happens to be the same stream in this case. Uh, the ice stuff I already showed you before. Here's where they create the offer, which I showed you the last time. Same, exact, same scenario here. And when the stream actually gets, comes in, they receive an on add stream event, which basically all we have to do here is set the source element on the video, uh, one of the, the, the tables in the, for the video, to the other guy's UR, to the, to the source for the other guy's URL. And that allows us to display, display the remote party. So it's pretty simple when it comes right down to it. All you, have to, all you need is your local URL, you need your, your remote URL, you set it, and you're done. Now, all this source code, I have to go through this quickly due to time, but all this source code is up uh, online, and you can download it, and you can try it, and you can poke and dissect it and figure out all the exact details, but I'm just trying to give you an overview of how it kind of works. So the final example here is where we're going to tie it together with our social identity, and a social identity like your login for Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or whatever have you. And in this case, I'm going to log, log in with uh, GitHub, because you can do OAuth with GitHub. And hopefully I've got an internet connection. Yes, I do. So this is where I do the OAuth step. I log in. It fetches my contacts. And I'm actually fetching from multiple identities in this, in this example, and that's why you see Eric Ligeray four times. It's because it's pulling off my Twitter, LinkedIn, and, and, and uh, the other feeds. And I'm gonna call Christoph, who's in Kelowna in Canada. Now here's where I ask the user to allow, and here we go, see if this works. There he is. I don't think we can hear. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't know if the audience can hear or not. Great. How's it going in Kelowna? Uh, it's nice and sunny. Excellent. So, there it is. And he added a little video message here. So, hi back. Here we go. So, this is local video, remote video and a data channel all working together, logged in through GitHub, pulled down your identities, and that's it. So thanks, Christoph. I'm gonna let you off the hook for now, and I'll call you back if we have any questions that I can't answer. Great, bye. Bye. All right. There we go. So let me show you the source code to this one. It's a little bit more involved, and that's why I broke it up to the previous example, so I don't have to re-explain, and I know I'm going way too fast for this. I, it's unfortunate, but I kind of have to. So again, it's a simple, in this case, he's using a very probably ugly way of doing it, but he's just swapping different views on the same page, but it works. And he has a login view, and he has a contacts view, and he has a calls uh, dialog and a logout view. It's pretty straightforward stuff. But what's interesting here, he's implemented something called a Rolodex. Now, this Rolodex is more than just a Rolodex. It's actually doing two functions. One, it's pulling down, it's allowing you to do OAuth, uh, and it's pulling down your contact list on your behalf from the various social identity providers but it's also acting as a relay because as I explained before, those SDPs have to exchange from one browser to the other. And in order for that to happen, you need to relay that SDP through some mechanism because you don't have a peer connection to start with. So it has to start through some kind of relay. And so what he actually does here is he opens up a WebSocket to this relay server and he'll send up the SDP through the Rolodex, and it will be received from the remote party who's logged in. 
Now, the way he's doing the identity stuff is actually really, really simple. So where is he doing in here? Let me see his events. I know he's got, here we go. So he's adding a whole bunch of events that come from the Rolodex, which is like contact fetched, contact comes online, contacts away, contact will be back. That has to do with the timeout issues. Don't worry about that. Um, and the contact is off offline. And basically, whenever he does that, he does a very quick and dirty hack here, which he re-renders the entire contact list. Like, I'm not presenting on, on UI here. I'm presenting just on, on this aspect, so forgive me if it's a little ugly. But basically, what he does is the relay server, uh, this Rolodex, whenever you sign up to it or you use it, it gives you uh, an ID. Every user, its own unique ID, whether you're on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or whatever. And when you get your contact list, you get your, all your friends, and it's returning that ID of your friend who's also logged in. So when you go through the Rolodex, you can send, say, say send a relayed message to this ID, and they receive it. And that's how we basically do the, the SDP exchange. We, we take that SDP, and we say, send it to this remote ID. That's it. Simple as that. But so down here is where when we receive a message from the remote party through the Rolodex, which is this contact message, he has a special message type called offer. So when you receive the offer, that would be receiving the SDP through the relay. And that's where he does that whole setup of the peer connection stuff, which I showed you earlier in the, the previous examples. And what he'll do is he'll send the answer to that party through the same mechanism. And uh, it's a little bit more involved here, and I really don't want to go through the whole example, but basically all it is is tying the, the downloading of the contacts and the ID association to that previous stuff I showed you, the previous two examples, putting it all together so you can do remote, remote video. And I'll show you the link to download this so you can download and play with this. But that's all there really is to it. Okay, that's it for the examples there. So skip these. Now comes the issues, and there are, are a lot of them. And this one, I would say, is probably the most important of all, because you guys might not realize it, but you guys are going to be changing the face of telecommunications around the world if you pay attention to this particular slide. You know, the telephone is a 100-year-old technology, but one thing that's great about it is anybody with a phone number can call any other person on the planet. But with websites, no, we're all our little islands. You've got your user base, I've got user, my user base. We can't talk across these, these domains. We don't do that. And that's something I, I strongly implore you to consider doing. So when I just showed you how to do all of that signaling and figure it out yourself, I actually say, don't do that. Use some common library that's, that's being under development and make sure that you can talk to someone else's website. That's, feder that's true federation. You're not just socially signing into one identity but still remaining on your island. You're actually able to, from your website, call a user on a completely independent domain and talk to them. And that's the only way we're going to not last another 100 years with the, you know, those 10 or 11 digit phone numbers that we have to dial all the time. But that's only going to happen if you guys do it. And the next thing I want you to consider is some of you who are going to be doing this kind of technology are going to be asked, well, let's interface with the telephone. And I say, you really want to do that? Because that is really difficult to do. It takes a lot of effort because you're going to receive these STP blobs from these legacy devices that come back from way no, who knows when. There's an entire company set up to rewrite those STPs to make sure they're compatible between devices. And oftentimes, when you're trying to talk between devices, you have to go through a lengthy process of compatibility. So if you want to interface with a telephone system, knock yourself out. But wouldn't it be better to take that effort, instead deliver the best on-net communication experience you can, 
and step away from the old telephone network? I leave that up to you to decide. The other thing to factor in is if you build your own signaling and you decide, oh, I'm going to go it alone anyway. I'm going to do my own thing because it's really easy. Well, it's not because the, there, there's a lot of innovation going on in the browsers. They're talking about adding features up the wazoo. And if you want to keep up to date with all of these different things that's going on, it's going to be a real challenge. So it's better to take someone who's actively, proactively looking into these problems, investigating them, and coming up with a decent API for you guys to implement. And you also have to worry about scaling. Whatever you do, can it scale up to you know, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of users? It's a hard problem. And then you, know, you take the browser problem, and you bring it onto the mobile platform, and the problem just explodes. It doesn't get easier. So, I just want to caution you, and that's why you might want to look at you know, some of those, those three protocols that are up there and to see who has WebRTC implementations for them. Um, the other factor here to consider is that WebRTC is not universal. There's the three major uh, vendors that are implementing it, and then we've got Apple, who curiously has said nothing, and we don't know what they're doing. So, you may end up having an entire browser market that can't do WebRTC. And then you've got Internet Explorer, who's come up with their own competing standardization of how this should be done. So Microsoft is going it alone, or we don't actually know, because they haven't actually released a browser that does it yet. They've just come up with a specification. And I would say that they actually have a lot of technical merit in what they've done. So I don't want anybody, well, don't tell me and bash it because it's actually pretty decent. I don't work for them or anything, but it's actually pretty good. So, but it's going to cause fragmentation in the marketplace. So that's going to make it even more difficult to support a standard when it comes to how to communicate between one browser and the other if the browsers don't talk the same thing or use the same API at all. And then you've got to factor in what are you going to do for your mobile users? If you have an HTML5 uh, WebRTC app that works great in these browsers but can't be supported on your mobile device, what are you going to do? Because you're cutting off a huge percentage of your user base who actually is going to want to communicate on these mobile devices. I mean, that's kind of the point of where we most probably want to use this technology. So if your browser on these mobile devices doesn't support it, you're going to have to probably build a hybrid model or even a native application, which you're going to have to embed a media stack into and a real-time communication stack. And where are you going to get that from? So you're going to have to source that technology to make it work. So there's a lot of challenges when you use this technology. But there are options. OK, which I'm not going to tell you yet. <laughs> the other thing you've got to factor in is that Real-time communication security is not the same as data storage um, security. So, and the reason why I say that is because you usually have to worry about your, your data being stored offline and it, it's there in a secure fashion. When it comes to real-time communication, people are going to be talking about really sensitive things. And it's really difficult to get security right, especially when it comes to comes to this kind of technology. And even if you do have the right principles, it's still easy to muck it up and get it wrong. So one of the things you might want to consider is using something that has been well vetted so that you can make sure that your communications are, in fact, secure. And another thing, especially with the, you know, this unknown agency in the middle here who's been spying on everybody, you're going to want to have your customers going to want a little bit of reassurance that they're not tapping into your communications if they're talking through you. If all of your messaging is being relayed through your server, they can do it. There's nothing stopping them. So you might want to come up with a technique to make sure that they can't do that so you can reassure your customers. And then finally, if you have a bunch of servers and you have all this communication going through, you're going to become a prime target for hackers to want to have access to all of that very sensitive data that's going back and forth between people. So you really have to secure up your servers very well. 
those are your options, basically, when it comes down to it. You can go it alone. You're going to be your own island. You can uh, take some new JavaScript libraries that are coming up. They don't offer a lot of features yet, but I'm sure that'll improve over time. You can use SIP, which is a, an older protocol, but it, it can be done. And there's a lot of people providing some WebRTC implementations for that. You can use XMPP. It's probably better for, than SIP in some ways, but still has some problems, especially when it comes to relaying data through servers. And then you can come up with, uh, you can also use OpenPeer, which is a technology that, that my company is actually sponsoring. And we've been trying to solve a lot of these problems that you're going to face. So of course, I'm a little bit biased, and I'm not going to claim otherwise. But those are really your options when it comes down to it. So you'll find all of the source code for the WebRTC demos up on openpeer.org. Just scroll down to repositories. And you'll see it all there. And if you want to get in contact with me, that's how. And that's all I have to say. And I've got about eight minutes for some Q&A if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, thank you. Does someone have a microphone? Right. Well, that's actually a very good question. So it's, it's VP8, the codec for, that Google's promoting. And then there's a H.264, which is the uh, consortium that has lots of patents on that. And I think it's really going to come down to it. It's probably going to have to be both. And I don't know what you're going to have to do for commercialization. There's, I mean, you have, when it comes to the consortium, you're going to have to pay royalties. And I don't think you're going to get around that. Um, they're trying to push for VP8 for obvious reasons, but there's even some questionable patents around that. And I know that some people are, are even considering, well, let's do yet another Kodak. So there's a lot of ambiguity over that. And I, I would say that's one of the reasons WebRTC has been delayed so much to this point, is because there's a lot of questions around patents. And until that gets truly solved and they come up with a final decision, it's a big unknown. So it's a very good question, because I didn't include that in the slide. Anybody else have any questions? Is uh, OpenPeer uh, just the protocol? Or are there uh, JS libraries or, or other libraries that would be used? Uh, the, the OpenPeer is a specification. So, and it's also SDKs that are uh, native for various mobile devices that are the reference implementation of that protocol. And there is also a JavaScript library that's heavily under development at this point, And that's going to be ready in a, in a couple months for everybody to use. And it's a secure peer-to-peer -peer communication protocol that bypasses servers for communication, including signaling. I guess we can talk about security. Are you talking about wrapping things in SSL or other ways of doing this for security? It's, SSL is not enough. SSL will get you your security between you and your web server. And they also have a, a technology called DTLS, which actually is the data channel signaling which they use between browser to browser. Uh, but that's still not sufficient in my mind. I mean, maybe it is for some, because you've actually, with those two technologies, you still have to have a well-known server that has a signed certificate from, from uh, you know, VeriSign or whoever. And that means the data that becomes unencrypted in the server, which means that becomes a prime target for people to actually attack and get all that you know, nice, juicy data that they want. Or at least the key material that is being sent between the two, even if the data goes peer to peer. If I garble this just a little bit, uh, 
I saw web sockets, and when I, when I think of web sockets, I think of a browser initiating a call to a, uh, you know, a, a web server of some sort. I've never uh, seen you know, the opposite, obviously, where the server actually calls, initiates a call to a browser. Now, peer-to-peer, -peer, we're talking about a browser basically being able to receive. Is that true with WebRTC, to receive a... I'm sorry, a, I'm having a real hard time with the... With, okay. Uh, I guess I can speak up, or is it just too far from my mouth? <laughs> It might be a bit of both, but... Okay, so will one with WebRTC, is a browser able to receive without initiating a, a call, or is, does there need to be an initiation through, a, you know, th through an intermediary? Because WebSockets is a browser always initiating to a web server, right? So now yeah. we've got two browsers. So it would imply, I guess, that a browser has to actually be able to receive without initiating. Right. That's, that's actually a very good question. You absolutely need an intermediary because of firewalls. It's impossible to initiate a connection between one peer to, uh, to another peer without having some kind of intermediary, at least to begin with. But once you've got that intermediary relay, you can drop that server out of the picture and signal peer to peer from that point on. That would be my recommendation. Um, but you're going to have to protect your keying from your own server if you want it to become secure. Uh, the examples that uh, you showed, or the example that you showed, was a call between two parties. What, uh, if you could briefly, is the outlook for calls with more than two parties, group calls? Absolutely. I've seen some uh, demos of that. I actually haven't poked into the source code myself of that, and I've seen them in the browser, so I'm not sure if, if they're you know, nightly bills or they're actually in the, uh, the current versions that you can actually download or not. Um, that'll certainly be there. And uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do uh, conferencing, um, whether it be where one party sends the other, and, you know, every party sends to every other party, or, or one party is the central point where he relays the data between, or you go off to some kind of conferencing server. But I do know that the browsers will be implementing this technology, absolutely. We've got about two and a half minutes for more questions, if you'd like. That's none. There's no questions. <laughs> no questions. It's all clear. You guys can code it now. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one more round of applause for Robin.